Hello all, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 108. Uh, we'll talk about as COVID rates drop, what's the plan for normal, and uh, I hope, think we really need an after action report in the next few months. So the good news is that uh, rates in Lincoln, for example, are dropping uh, quite, quite steeply here, and it's being followed uh, a few weeks later by lower hospitalization rates. So they've dropped about uh, almost 20 uh, hospitalizations uh, since, uh, since about uh, last week. Omaha actually seeing an even steeper uh, drop from 452 down to 342, so a drop of 110 hospitalizations. So hopefully that continues and a sign of uh, good things to come. Uh, adding to that evidence, we've got two other sources of information at a community level. One is U University of Nebraska. Their, their positivity rates dropped by more than half, and Lincoln Public Schools, our rates are dropping. Uh, we peaked at about 1,200 uh, positives for student staff a couple weeks ago, down to 952, then 421 last week. This is a partial week. We'll see hopefully that, uh, that by the time the end of the week comes, it's still lower. Uh, also, our unfilled sub rates, for example, went to drop from 40, a little over 40% down to single digits, which is closer to normal. Uh, so we'll be back to full week in school, which is great for our kids. Uh, Lincoln announced it's going to extend its mask mandate for another two weeks, which I agree with. I think uh, we're certainly get uh, this is a very positive sign. Uh, I think there's a chance this it may only need to be another two weeks. So fingers crossed we continue to drop like this. It'd be nice to just be past the mask uh, finally after almost two years. Um, you know, uh, some things for optimism. So I was a little cautiously optimistic with South Korea or South Africa and UK data. However, that wouldn't might not be comparable because South Africa is a younger population and the UK is much more vaccinated than us. But if you look at New York and, and uh, New Jersey, which is HH, HHS Region 2 here, you see a huge drop in hospitalizations. Uh, they're about two weeks ahead of us, so hopefully that's a good uh, sign of things to come. Uh, are they comparable to us? Well, uh, New York has a little better first and second shot vaccination, but they're actually behind us when it comes to booster shots. So you see 88, 75, and 31. We're 73, 65, and 36, so at least on the boosters, we're a little ahead of them. So it would be nice to have those that vaccination rates a little higher. We are making some progress, but I think close enough that I can say that, we say that we'll probably follow New York and New Jersey's trajectory. So our rates in our region are also dropping, just like Omaha's uh, that you just saw previously. So this is a sign that, uh, that hopefully we're heading in the right direction and could be done with masks in a few weeks. Um, frustrating thing, of course, would be nice to have some clear guidance on what our goals are. And so uh, this article from CNN that, uh, yeah, the risks are going the right direction. Uh, across the country, people are considering dropping their mask ordinances by end of February or March, for example. Uh, but we really don't have a good clear guidance, and the CDC has really been kind of vague. Uh, Caitlin Gentilina, a couple days ago, kind of did a post about like this, say, you know, what are the metrics we're looking at? You know, what things should we be following? Uh, you may remember some few, I suppose, back, I talked to James Lawler, and we have had a few proposals that we proposed as well, including 85% for a vaccination rate, for example. Uh, we're not getting anywhere close to that, but maybe uh, when people, the people have had two or three uh, bouts of COVID, they might have enough immunity that that's good enough, too. Uh, we'll, we'll see in the future. So, you know, criteria we could be reading, it'd be nice to have something a little better with case rates, but, you know, based on what, because our test uh, uh, reporting is really erratic, so I don't know if you could use that very well. So at the bottom there, wastewater surveillance might be an example we could use. Uh, vaccination rates ideally would be over 85%, but maybe a lower number if you account for infection acquired immunity. Of course, we want hospital health systems and workforce capacity to be back. Workforce capacity, at least at the school level, is already back. Uh, hospitalizations, you know, they're dropping, so hopefully we can get to the point where the hospitals can get a break. At some point, though, we'll have to talk about what is an acceptable death rate. It's not going to be zero. Uh, just like uh, influenza, we get about 30,000 deaths a year, nowhere near the 300 to 500,000 we've been at, at, at racking up the last two years, unfortunately. So what is that death rate we think we should get around to before we, quote, go back to normal? I think there needs to be a good discussion on that. Hopefully this is the last major surge and we don't have another four or 500,000 deaths next year or for 2022 anyway. Uh, we need to talk a little bit more about prevention. So in the future, we may have to do more around ventilation. So MERV 13 air filters and improved air changes. Uh, ventilation was kind of something paid, people paid attention to back 100 years ago when the, when things like tuberculosis was an issue. We've kind of maybe forgotten some of those important things. So that's something we ought to look at in future. Uh, what prevent, preemptive measures could we take last time so we can maybe prevent this another crisis where our hospitals were overwhelmed again? And waste survey, water surveillance may be a good way of doing that case rate monitoring at the community level. Uh, Caitlin Jettelina does a nice uh, update on that. Actually, they've got a couple cases around the country where actually, it actually seems to be pretty accurate. Uh, and so wastewater surveillance might be nice because it doesn't require individuals to do anything. You can pretty much test kind of at any point in the sewers between your toilet and the, in the wastewater plant. And so that could give you a good idea. Plus, you can even monitor uh, for uh, variants, for example. And so this is uh, maybe the future of how we have sort of our early warning for when COVID might get bad again. 
uh, MISC in kids. So the kids uh, we're seeing getting more data, unfortunately, on multi-inflammatory syndrome in kids. Uh, this seems to peak about two to six weeks after an infection. It's an inflammatory response that acts kind of like Kawasaki disease. And Nebraska's actually had a few more than typical, uh, not as much as the as the as the, the South or California, for example. Example. Uh, the downside uh, for the kids who are, we do have vaccinations in 5 to 11 year olds, and if we could vaccinate more of our 5 to 11 year olds, we'd have, we'd have, do a better job of preventing that. So those of you who are kind of on the fence, uh, should I get my 5 to 11 year old vaccinated? Yes, you should because of the rates of MASC at the highest are in 5 to 11 year olds. We've got really good data that vaccination prevents that. So for hospitalizations in kids, 73% of those hospitalizations are unvaccinated. And from MISC specifically, or multi-inflammatory syndrome, 98% of those kids are unvaccinated. So get your kid vaccinated. Uh, they, we've had some, a pretty good response and uptake uh, from our school-based uh, vaccination sites uh, uh, here in Lincoln around the low-income schools. Uh, and so that's been nice to see. Uh, you know, vaccines are safe. There's actually over 10 billion doses have been given worldwide. So we know exactly what the safety is. There's no worry about finding any, any un, you know, un, people worry about what about some possible long-term side effect. We have, we've, there've been enough. It's been around long enough. We know what those, uh, those side effects are. Uh, there's already been get over 10,000 doses given just to kids age 5 to 11 in Lincoln so far. So we've got tons of experience with this. This is no longer investigational. Uh, and again, you know, we have the Nebraska data on Nebraska, uh, patients and hospitalizations by a Nebraska epidemiologist showing that one shot is uh, just doesn't doesn't or no shots versus two shots versus three shots you get a massive reduction in hospitalization rates 46 six times less likely to be hospitalized such that if you have three shots I'd say in the next few weeks you can act like a typical this is a typical flu year and that's why I think it uh, for those of us with three shots uh, going without mass may not be any big deal unless you're immunocompromised, and that's the problem. So, uh, but right now I think there's some options for if you're immunocompromised. One, we're getting good data, which I'll show in a second, on that, that a good mask will work and protect you. Cloth masks are good for preventing spread from somebody who has infection to somebody else, but to protect yourself, you really want a better mask. Uh, you should talk to your physician about a fourth shot or Evusheld as a possibility. So Evusheld is a monoclonal or an antibody infusion that you can get that might give you six months of protection. Uh, there's oral medications like Paxlovid, which should become more available in the next month or so. And your drop, your risk also drops when the COVID rates around you drop. So I think, uh, you know, that should give you some uh, confidence that maybe things are getting better. for uh, you. As far as the the masks, again, this is a study not, ju not just where someone with coronavirus preventing spread with a cloth mask, but how much does the mask protect you? The cloth mask, like we said for a long time, it's 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 good for preventing spread from somebody who's infected, but protecting you not quite as good. And they were they were it looked like there was a reduction, but it wasn't statistically significant. However, it was significant for either a surgical mask with that little uh, metal pinch, but the respirator masks like the N95 and KN95 were pretty effective. So you can you can protect yourself by wearing that mask in uncertain environments if they're immunocompromised. Uh, accessibility of the, of the medications like, like Paxlovid and, and uh, Molnupiravir and Evusheld is a little frustrating, but there is a site now, the Department of Health and Human Services put up where you can kind of track in your community. So here in Lincoln, for example, if you go to the site, you can see that there's two places where you can get Paxlovid plus down the road in Seward. Uh, for example, they got the addresses and even shows uh, available in a lot of doses. Uh, immunocompromised and you're looking for someone who might have Evusheld, we'll certainly talk to your doctor. Uh, and a lot of places around Lincoln, for example, can, can give you that Evusheld infusion. So this is a site you can kind of see where it's available. And, and if this is your physician, let's say your physician is Dr. Eric Avery at Nebraska Hemonc, well, you could go to his office. He's got it. Um, you know, and the next thing I think we need to talk about now is an after action report. What did we redo wrong? What did we do right? What could we, could we do better next time? These are things, uh, concepts, you know, used by army generals for centuries going all the way back to Julius Caesar. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, report of the history of after action reports, essentially. Uh, we know that what's worked and what's not. We can look at the mortality rate. I usually tell people at the end of the day in quality improvement, it's dead versus not dead because there's not a lot of debate there. So if you look at the COVID mortality rates, uh, the good thing is about Nebraska is we have the lowest COVID mortality of all the states around us. Other, a few other states like Utah and Maine, for example, did better. But around, in our region, we actually did the best. Uh, and if you break it down and below Nebraska level, Lincoln and Lancaster County uh, did the lowest of all of them. Uh, and there was a twofold variation just within Nebraska with the, the rural areas in Nebraska is having a mortality rate twice that of Lincoln and Omaha or Lincoln uh, with Omaha being a little in between. This is the neighboring states. If you're not a, if you're not a number spreadsheet person, uh, here's what it looks like in a bar graph. Uh, so uh, certain areas did much better than other areas. Uh, both Lincoln, Bellevue, and Omaha did better than all of our surrounding states and there are the rest of Nebraska. 
Uh, Bellevue, some people say, well, Bellevue didn't do as much as Lincoln, but you know, Bellevue had a younger population. So to really do this, this analysis right, you'd want age adjusted mortality rate. I don't have the data because I don't have direct access to that, but our state epidemiologist and our College of Public Health could do that and put together a nice report about you know, how did we do across the state, who did better than who, and start kind of teasing out you know, who put intervention and when, and so next time we'll have a better idea what to do. Uh, some of you may have been surprised if you're a subscriber on the YouTube channel, you saw this video pop up. And so backstory is COVID, COVID videos like this are not my day job. My day job is actually do it working with health systems on quality improvement, uh, how to save money, how to make people healthier. And so I gave a presentation uh, last week to Leadership Lincoln to the executives. I do the advocates tomorrow. I asked the executives, said, hey, you've watched this 20 minute video because what we do is I send the 20 minute video out ahead and then the, for our meeting, we just do all Q&A. Said, should I make that public? And they said, yes. So that's why that popped up and it's got about 400 views. It's what I do in my day job. And my hope is that I'm actually pretty close to the end of these COVID talks. I'm, I, there's a chance that this might be the, uh, the last two or in the last two or three, that would be great because I'm ready to move on to my day job and spend more time doing this stuff. Uh, so, if, so once that happens, you might want to stop subscribing or if you're just interested in health policy in general, you might want to watch some of these videos, uh, but those will be out there. So uh, hopefully this is helpful again. Uh, this is what I do in my day job. Disclaimer that these are my opinions and not necessarily those of all these people I work with and for, but this is where I work for a living so you know who I am and know that I'm not just some uh, random conspiracy theorist and am gamefully employed doing this. So there you go.